Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for those of you who are here for the first time. Welcome. And for those of you coming back from yesterday, uh, thanks for coming back. I hope you had a, a nice restful day yesterday. You learned something and you put it into practice. In your practice, you were able to, uh, you know, try some new things yesterday. Uh, it was great to see everyone yesterday. We had a lot of people come and uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. We had, a, we had a great time and it was, really, it was really great how engaging you guys were in the process. And that's, uh, that's a really important part of these workshops and what we're on about is that, is that uh, if everyone participates, we get, we get multiplying the information and, uh, and everyone gets a, a great value out of the, out of the experience. Uh, so I learned a lot of new things yesterday. I uh, hope you guys did. Uh, we talked about uh, seven keys to a good routine. We started with uh, goal setting, making sure that we've, we've got a dream and then, uh, and then working back from that and then structuring our practice. Maybe shrinking, for some of us, maybe shrinking the amount of uh, practice time we do in any one session and breaking it up into little segments. Um, and we also learned about uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of devices or, or apps. There was a, the um, Seconds Pro app, which is, which is really, really handy. And, and there are a bunch of other suggestions that people put forward. But the Seconds Pro app is really great, keeps you on track and it stops you from having to think when you're practicing about what you're going to be playing next. You just follow the app. So uh, for those of you who didn't, uh, who weren't here yesterday, Seconds Pro, uh, is, you can get it at the, um, at, for both Android and, and, uh, and Apple devices. Uh, it's about a three, four dollar app. Uh, it's, uh, it's really handy for planning your practice. And then, of course, we learn how to save money, which uh, for me is always a good thing because I spend too much of it. And, uh, you know, and I've discovered that we, uh, we saved a lot of money thanks to Ripple. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a wrap up from yesterday. So for those of you who weren't here yesterday and have no idea why you're here, uh, you, you may still never, never have any idea why you're here, but uh, this is to give you a little bit more info. Uh, I'm Andrew, Andrew Bain. I'm the principal horn of the LA Phil and uh, play the horn and teach the horn uh, and have had a pretty interesting career working uh, from my student life through playing theater musicals, Broadway musicals in Sydney, uh, opera and ballet uh, through to seven symphony jobs. And uh, now here I am uh, in the LA Phil, play a bit of film music. I uh, like to play a bit of chamber music and I get to play um, concertos and and solo stuff around the world from time to time, get to do a few things. So that's, um, that's a lot of fun for me. And Rupal is an MBA uh, in everything. No, she, she has an MBA. She's, uh, she's a master of environmental science in sustainability uh, and a business and tax strategist uh, is a qualified tax preparer. Um, she's also uh, has to deal with me so that, that there should be a degree in that. Uh, but uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> She unfortunately doesn't get any paperwork for that. We have two little kids, so um, that keeps us busy and uh, keeps us young. And yeah, and um, invested musician, for those of you who maybe haven't been to all of Andrew's um, warm-ups and just getting to know us, this is kind of our uh, brainchild, our third child, and it's something we've been developing for a long time, really trying to pull the two sides of these coins together and integrate it. We've learned so much along the way through, you know, within Andrew's career and then for me on my business side, and we've really worked to come up with the blueprint of how we think, um, you know, one can be successful and not just on the career and the professional side, but also on all the admin and the tax and the finance and the messy side. So we've, um, we think that's, we think that's a really kind of unique package. And so that is who Invested Musician is. We wanna help other people kind of take their careers to the next level and um, we wanna be there to support, support you guys along the way. So that's what we're all about, why we're doing this workshop. <laughs> so the overview, so this is just the, the outline. So yesterday we talked about uh, practice planning, uh, organizing our practice, a bit of goal setting stuff. Obviously there's a lot more to that section than, than we could cover yesterday. Um, but, uh, but hopefully that gave you a good start into, into you know, the thinking about how you can plan your practice better and set your goals. And Ripple talked about financial planning. Obviously there's, I mean, there's a huge area for that, but we got some amazing, you guys had some great suggestions about what you, where you can make savings, where you can make cuts. We learned about the earns system. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking about building the bridge from technique to musical mastery. So um, we'll get back, we'll get into that in a minute. And Ripple's gonna be talking about tax stuff 
uh, how you, you know, what, what are the deductions you can, you can make that maybe you don't realise and what, what actual tax, uh, you know, situation are you in? And how you can how you can maybe rethink about um, about uh, how you're approaching uh, paying or reducing your taxes. And then on Friday tomorrow we get into the mental side of things. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, what how, my mental approach to to uh, preparing <clears throat> preparing for concerts, uh, how I deal with the stress of concerts, how how we um, you know how how I cope when I'm not feeling confident. How I how I become more confident, how um, I learn how how I've learned how to recover when I make mistakes in concerts uh, and rehearsals. How I use rehearsal period to um, to to make sure that my performance is at the highest level when I'm under the most amount of stress. So that should be a fun one. It's going to be a fun one for me to talk about because I get to remember all the things that I did wrong and then what I learned from them and hopefully got them right at some point. And then uh, Rip and I are going to talk about investing in yourselves. Um, how we can take that further, and how we can how we can help you to um, you know, invest in your in your uh, musical life, and how that will you know circle back and and hopefully um, pay back on the other end, so that it's it, it works as a circle. Do you have anything? Heard, yeah, and on that last note, um, we're really going to touch on the fact that the industry is uncertain right now, and how you can do that. Things you can do now, even with you know everything going on around us that will still drive you forward. And we have a lot of experience in, in um, uncertain times in our, in our lives. And so we're gonna share with you kind of what we, our tips on that. So we're excited. <laughs> we hope you're gonna join us as well, join us as well tomorrow. Yeah. And so um, the, okay. these three days will, will give you a taste of, of you know, what, what we're on about and, and some of the ideas that you might wanna extend, extend further. For those of you who have been coming to the warm up classes on Monday morning, Two things. One, I am doing the recap, so don't panic. It is in the works. It will be up today. Um, and and uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, that was a busy day, so I didn't get a chance to uh, chance to do it. But it will be done. So uh, don't panic. If you have any questions about what's going on in the warm up classes, let us know. Um, that will still continue. That's still on Mondays at eight o'clock in the morning, LA time. Uh, so if you're keen in Australia, it's one in the morning. Good luck with that. Uh, but other places, it's a little bit more of a, uh, you know, palatable time. But uh, but th this this workshop leads us in, leads us into into uh, what we've mentioned in the WAP classes, where we're developing a, a larger program for people who would, who would be interested. It's not going to be for everybody, but uh, the the goal of the program is, uh, is as I said, eight weeks, and it's uh, and it's a very uh, individualised uh, program that uh, that is designed to bring your playing to another level. And, and, to, and to really achieve what you, know, what you want to achieve uh, from your instrument. Obviously, uh, the horn segment of it, it will be with me. There'll be individual lessons. Uh, we'll be working on uh, you know, weekly group sessions, actually multiple weekly group sessions, um, working with the technology that we have uh, with the internet, working on a lot of recording and analysis and feedback uh, on, a, on a regular weekly basis. Uh, and then we have a couple of fun projects. We'll have a bunch of guests that will be coming in uh, and we'll also be discussing a lot of the stuff, expanding on a lot of the stuff we've been talking about in this uh, workshop. So working with goal setting and practice planning, mental training, audition preparation is obviously a big one for a lot of people. Um, we have, uh, you know, that's quite an expansive part of the course uh, to understand how to best get, you know, how to get the best out of yourself for auditions and how best to prepare. Is a very clear uh, path that I have. Having won seven of them, I feel as though I have some level of qualification to talk about that. Um, and then, of course, career coaching, where you are in your career at the moment, where you want to go, and and we can we can work with you side by side to to achieve those those goals. And then, of course, in in uh, in the finance area, uh, you know, we want we're wanting to make sure that we we're creating an environment for you to feel supported, uh, you know, in whichever direction you want to go. So. Um, we all need money and we all need to save money. So uh, there's an area there, of course, that Rip will be working uh, hand in hand with you for working at how you can, planning for how you can generate more income from the situation you're currently in, uh, strategic tax planning uh, for your future, and then, um, and then how to market yourself and how to, how to get yourself out there and how to interact with your colleagues in a way that is, is going to be very productive and how to manage your day to day. This is something we're really excited about, but like Andrew said, we want it. We want it to be kind of um, built by the community as and well. 
Um, I just want to say there's a question, Juliet asked the question, is it just for horn players? Absolutely not. Uh, obviously, there's one of, the, one of the main segments is going to be related to horn playing. If, if you want to have an um, individual lesson with me uh, or lessons with me and work with me on a weekly basis multiple times uh, and you're not a horn player, that's, you're absolutely welcome to do that. But the areas that we, we figure are, are going to be more for, for every musician are certainly uh, the areas of the mental training, goal setting, practice planning, uh, audition preparation, performance preparation, performance planning uh, and career coaching and then also the financial stuff. That's obviously going to be relevant to every musician and, uh, and we want to provide that for everybody. So obviously, you know, if you're interested in being involved in, that, in the program, we can certainly work with you to, to, uh, to set a program that's going to be really beneficial for you, if you're, even if you're a viola player, which everyone knows that, uh, is my favourite instrument. No, it's, it's, I, I love all instruments. Viola is a beautiful instrument, actually. <laughs> Luckily in the LA field, we've got one of we've got one of the best viola sections in the universe. It's amazing. Yeah, yes, yeah, so great. It is open. It, we do want to make it accessible to everybody, um, and so we're open to you know finding ways to kind of customize things and you know and if you feel like you're fully in control of your finance and your tax and you know getting all the jobs you want and you're keeping them and everyone loves you, then you don't need that last piece too. We can you know we'll work with you guys on it and also maybe you can help teach the class. Building the bridge. So uh, we, we mentioned yesterday uh, in the session, uh, working with uh, the ideas of, of technique or physical, musical and mental. So yesterday uh, was obviously our technique day um, and our physical day. So, so the, idea, the idea being that, you know, we're setting up our practice plan around the majority of our practice, probably about two thirds of our practice, actual physical practice will be technique related. Um, and so that's, that's addressing the technical elements of your playing. So what other technical elements are you playing? Please jump in if I miss something, right? So you've got to be able to play high. This is mostly to do with horn playing or brass playing, but it can, it's pretty much for every instrument, right? You've got to be able to play high, you've got to be able to play low, loud, soft, flexibly with articulation and a variety of articulation. With coordination, so being able to coordinate your fingers and your tongue and get over registers. Be able to play large intervals, small intervals, by various lengths of notes, register shifts and dynamic shifts and dynamic changes. Now that pretty much covers most things. There's horn play, you need to be able to play lip trills and stuff like that, right? Double tonguing, various different types. But, but this, is, this is one of the areas that we need to really address in our, in our playing that not really is often related to music. We want to, we want to link it to music, but, but basically if we can't do those, uh, those components on the instrument, it's going to be very difficult for us to play music. So what we want to be doing is we start with a very basic, the, these very basic building blocks and we want to be able to expand them and be able to spend time to, to expand those elements in a way that's going to be productive and efficient and is going to build the quality. It's not going to place too much strain on that quality too soon. So what I see is in, in a lot of undergraduate students, and I did this as a student, definitely as a high school student, and definitely as an undergraduate student, I felt that um, the harder the studies that I played and the harder the pieces I played, the better I would get. It would be a default situation. If I played Strauss II when I was 16, I would automate, you know, and that would make everything else easier. Well, to a certain extent it does, but the techniques that I was using in order to get around Strauss II was something that made my life really, really difficult when I was playing Mile of Five in my 20s because I would use all these shortcuts to be able to get around it. I wasn't actually developing the best basic fundamental technique. So yeah, it's, it's important to, for me in my, in my de development of playing to start with a very, very clear idea of what the basis of my fundamentals are and then gradually expand that. So I don't want to build it too fast so that I can't focus on the elements that I'm wanting to, to make sure are there. So I want to build a very stable base. So I want to start with exercises that are going, going to gradually extend the elements that I'm working on and then progress them into studies. So there are going to be a variety of studies. They're going to be legato studies. They're going to be technique studies. As horn players, we play a lot of coprash. So coprash is, is, a, is basically a, fundamentally starts as a pretty technically based study book and, uh, and is really good for building these areas of, of basic fundamental technique. So it's very helpful.
but it doesn't particularly help us to be incredibly musical. It's not, it's not forcing us to expand our musicality. So they can be played very musically. And, and one of the things that I'm intending to do the next couple of months is actually record all of the Coprash, well, at least the first book and the second book is a bit hard, but uh, the first book, to show, to, to, to illustrate actually that it's not actually, the, the goal is not actually to play purely technically, but is actually to, to expand the technique and, and be as musical as you can in a situation that's not particularly inherently musical. But there are plenty of other studies that actually lead us towards the other, the other side, which is the music side, our next, our next phase, uh, that, that are going to really help that musicality. So there's, there's um, trombone players use this a lot, the Rochu or the Bordoni books. Uh, Conconi, I use them a lot for my students and for me. Conconi is a, is a trumpet study, but based on these singing etudes. And this is really, really good to, to allow us, our technique to stay intact, not place too much pressure on the technique, but exp expand our musicality. So this is, this is uh, something that, that I talk about quite a lot with my students, that, that spending time to establish your, your basic fundamentals and then gradually expand them is a really important thing. We don't need to put too much strain on them immediately. We wanna be creating great habits and building the habits as, as sustainably and as simply as possible. So that when you're under pressure, whatever happens under pressure, you're gonna go back to your habits and your habits, if they're good, you're gonna have a good product. And if they're shaky, they're gonna be a bit hit and miss. So we've all been through this phase, I'm sure, uh, particularly the horn players, where some, one day you pick up the horn and everything works and you sound great and you feel great and you think I've solved it, I'm the greatest horn player in the world, uh, that's it. We've, we've opened the door to great success, bring on the Berlin Philharmonic. And the next day you wake up and you're like, I can't get a sound and nothing speaks and my articulation is terrible and I don't know what I'm doing. And we've all been there, I've, I've certainly been there and it motivated me to think about like, why does that happen? And why it happens is because I, I wasn't actually starting with, with what is the process that I wanna establish to produce world-class sound. I was starting with, I wanna sound good. Now the reality is when every day you wake up, you feel different, your face feels different, your body feels different, your mind feels different. But if you go back to what is the process that I'm trying to execute, that can be the same every day. And that will be the thing that will be able to create the same level of product. So I'm really focusing on every, every day in my warm up, and this is hopefully what we see in the, in the warm up sessions, is that I'm focusing on process ahead of result, initially in the day. Obviously when we play concerts, it's super important that we're focusing on the result. We, we wanna play a great, concert. Everyone wants to play a great concert with a beautiful sound and everyone say that sounded great. In order to get there, I don't want to focus on the result. I want to focus on the process that is going to lead me to that point. So, so it's difficult because from a young age as, as a brass player, we're always told you have to play with a beautiful sound and you have to get the right notes, right? Who hasn't been told that? We've all been told that. And, and so this is, this is an important thing in our practice. Now, obviously we wanna have that in performance. We wanna have that when we're under pressure. But in order to get that securely, what's really important is that we focus on what are the elements that are gonna give us this level of quality when we're under pressure. So I'm setting up my system, as we talked about, in, as we talk about in the warm-up class, breathing is the base. And then I'm focusing on a few very simple points to ensure that I'm producing the same quality of product all the time. And from there, if, if I'm putting in the best ingredients, the result is gonna take care of itself. So that's a really important thing for me to keep in mind. And when we're under pressure, it's generally the first thing that goes out of the window. So technical, technical state, so we have, so in terms of the bridge, and let me explain the bridge. So on one side of the, one side of the bridge, as we see beautiful Sydney Harbour Bridge in the background of this slide, one of the most beautiful views. I had a job there for two years in the opera. It's an incredibly beautiful building on the outside. Now, one of the most, uh, one of the most stunning, stunning buildings in the world. And if you ever get a chance to go to uh, New Year's Eve uh, in Sydney, do it because it is, uh, it is, um, it will blow you away. It's absolutely amazing. Mind you, no one can get into Australia at the moment, so uh, <laughs> you don't have to worry too much about that. Um, so one side of the bridge, let's say the Sydney Harbour, uh, the, so the Opera House side of the bridge, is uh, we have our technique. And we want to build our technique as, as beautifully as the, as the opera house. And on the other side, the North Sydney side, for those people who know anything about Sydney, North Sydney side, uh, is, uh, is the music, musicality. And the, the bridge itself is our use of the techniques, uh, sorry, the, te the technical uh, exercises and the studies that we want to build that connection. So on, on the, on the left-hand side of the bridge, we've got more technique-based studies. 
We're working on just fundamental things, simple exercises that are going to grow that technique. And as we get to the other side of the bridge, we're focusing on more musical based studies, more realistic studies that are going to relate to the music. So, so it's, it's important for, this is from a technical point of view, from a horn playing point of view, or from a, any instrument playing point of view, that this is the way that we, this is the way that I think about approaching this development from technical through to musical. Now, what's important to, to um, remember is when we've got a technique that's, that's very solid and, and stable, it's, it's super important that we, that we think about building this bridge backwards and that we start from a musical uh, perspective. So when we have the techniques that we need, it's super important in music that we have, we have two things running parallel, that we have the musical side and we have the technique side. The musical side can be developed and needs to be developed independent of our technique. And by that I mean, we, most people's musical output is limited only by their technical ability. And we were talking about this last night with Rupal. I said, you know, like Rupal's actually a very good musician. She sings beautifully. She's got a lovely voice. She's, <laughs> plays, she sings very well in tune, right? And she's very naturally, she phrases beautifully. She's very naturally musical. Now, sadly, she's not a very good clarinet player. She doesn't have any technique and, you know, and she hasn't played for 20 years, right? So she, there's no way that she's going to be able to express her musicality through the clarinet because she's limited by her technique, no matter what goes on in her head. So what's important in our practice is that we don't spend all of our time trying to develop our musical picture in consort with our technical development or when we're playing the instrument, because then your musical picture will always be limited by the amount of technique that you have. I, I just want to interrupt and say that, um, that when Andrew and I, want to go golfing that I am always trying to just go straight to the golf course so we can, you know, have the lunch and the drinks and the car, you know, the golf cart and the whole experience. And he keeps dragging me to the driving range and I, or, you know, he practices so much in the backyard as well. And I don't, you know, I just thought maybe that's, I think I'm getting it now. Yeah, that's, that's true. You do have a lot more fun on golf if you can hit the golf ball. Well, it's funny that it's, it's an interesting concept. So I want to be developing my musical picture away from my technical practice as much as I can, right? So if I'm, if I'm playing Strauss II, or if I'm, if I'm playing a, uh, a new piece, let's say I'm, there's a brand new piece in the orchestra that I haven't played. It's, um, it's a tone poem by Strauss that I've, that I've never played before. What I, the first thing I want to be making sure that I'm doing is not picking up the horn and trying to practice it because I don't, have a, I don't have a map, I don't have a, an image of what I want to follow, and I don't have anything to pull onto the horn. And also I need to work, figure out what are the technical things that I need to really work on in order to be able to play this piece. So I want to have a look at that from a technical standpoint, make sure that I've got all the, all the techniques that I need to cover this piece. So I'm going to, going to look through the part, but I'm going to spend a lot of time listening to the piece, singing the piece, looking through the score to work out what are the musical things that I need to be understanding before I dive into actually attaching this to the horn. And it's the same thing that goes with audition preparation. There are so many people that they'll see in a job advertised and they say, okay, I'm going to audition for the first horn job in the Berlin Philharmonic. And they get the list and they have a look at the list and they start madly practicing excerpts six months out. And we'll talk a lot about this in the, in the, in the program. We're going to spend a lot of time um, on audition preparation, but this just gives us an idea of where, you know, what, what, where we're going. For me, the majority of the time that I need to spend is when, when I'm that six months out, I want to be learning those, those uh, excerpts, those pieces as clearly musically as I can away from the instrument. And I want to be raising my level of technique as high as I can at the same time. So that when those two elements come together, they're both at the highest level I can possibly achieve. One is not being impacted by the other. Does that make any sense to anyone? Is that clear? Yeah, I think that's a really important thing. Yeah, let us know in the chat. <laughs> Everyone's been a little bit quiet lately, so. So we talked a little bit about, uh, oh, expanding the circle of skill. Okay, expanding the circle of skill is another important one when we're talking about um, a preparation for pieces and preparation for, for excerpts. We all have a, a circle of skill, right? We have, we have our ability playing the instrument. And then there are certain pieces that lie outside of that circle. All right, so for, for me, 
one of the one of the pieces that tends to lie on the outer edge of my ability is Schoenberg Chamber Symphony. I find that a really challenging piece to play. So in my preparation for that piece, I'm not going to spend, and this is going back to the previous point, I'm not going to spend a lot of my time just practicing Schoenberg Chamber Symphony on the horn. I'm going to spend more time expanding my circle, expanding my the, the technical abilities so that over time, my technical ability will encompass the techniques that I need to play Schoenberg Chamber Symphony. While I'm doing that, again, as a parallel, I'm focusing on getting the musical picture as clear as I can for that piece away from the horn. So, so, the, focus, so the first thing is focus on studies and etudes so that, so that we're trying to build a technique in a manageable and, and a well-constructed way. I think of the way that we would build a house. You wanna build a foundation of the house nice and stably and make sure that that's settled and bedded down. And then we gradually build the walls and, and add, the, add the pieces to that. So that we're gradually, with our studies, we're expanding the difficulty um, and expanding and growing that basic fundamental technique. The focus of process over result is super important. Work out what are the elements that go into your playing? What are the technical elements that you want to expand? And make sure that you make a decision before you play a note, what are those processes that you want to put in place? If you execute the process really well, the result will take care of itself. And if, you ex if you're happy with your execution of the process and the result isn't what you want, then it gives you an opportunity to change the process and understand what you're changing. It's not gonna be random. Uh, technical studies are the other bridge. So, so we, we're moving from technique to, in, in terms of technical development, technique, we're gradually expanding those studies so that we're, we're bringing them more musical as we get to the musical element. And then how we, how we want to set this up from a musical standpoint is making sure that our, our musical, if we're playing concertos or if we're playing orchestral pieces or, or solo pieces, that we've got a clear musical idea of what we want to do musically before we attach that to the instrument. So that's building the bridge backwards. And then expanding the circle of skill. So we all have a circle of skill, the level of skill that we play at. We want to fo our focus, particularly when we're developing for auditions and, and big performances and throughout our career, we, we, our goal is to expand that technique, expand that skill so that it encompasses all of the pieces that we're going to have to play. We don't want to have a small circle and then a bunch of satellite abilities to be able to play. I can play, if I use a special technique, I can play Ravel Piano Concerto. If I have a special technique, I can play Shostakovich V. We, would, we want to be working to expand our abilities so that they encompass all of those pieces that we're, that we're going to uh, encounter along the way. So best practices for studying off the horn. Uh, there, there are a couple of ideas for me uh, that I, I mean, I, would, I spend a lot of time listening Listening and score reading, listening and playing the parts, singing along is really important. Mentally rehearsing is a really valuable way of practicing. And these are all things, practicing the musical side is all things that we're adding practice time without having to use your face without as a horn player or without spending time in the practice room. And it can be done at 11 o'clock at night, it can be done at six in the morning, there's no problem. So, uh, and, and I, my, my idea for, for, for my own personal idea of developing opinion over musical pieces in, term, in terms of symphonic repertoire is I want to listen to a lot of variety of things. I want to be really critical about what I like, what I don't like, and, and not, not in a way that, you know, this orchestra is no good or this orchestra is great. It's just, I just want to develop my opinion. I'm, I'm always wanting to be curious and, and, and develop an opinion about what I like and what I don't like, and then be able to explain it. Why don't I like the way that the, I don't know, the Melbourne Symphony plays Bruckner. I've, I've only played Bruckner once with them, so it's hard to say, and they, they sounded great. Um, but, you know, so what, what, what are the elements of that? What are, what are the elements that I want to, that I want to, or, or what are the elements that I really enjoyed about that performance? And, and you keep questioning yourself, but not related to horn playing, or well, in my case, horn playing, not related to my instrument, but related to what is the overall musicality? So why do we need a bridge? I think it's important in, in, in our practice. And as we talked about yesterday, um, having a plan is, is a really important thing. Having structure is really important. It helps us to, you know, to build sustained development. And, and it gives us a path backwards when something goes wrong. Things are gonna go wrong. They go wrong for me all the time. It's just that I'm able to fix them pretty quickly because I've got an idea of what I'm doing. 
So building this bridge, understanding that, yep, technique is a really important thing, fundamentals is a really important thing, and growing them in a sustainable way is super important. Um, and, then, and then making sure that I'm also building my musical blocks at the same time. The other, the other thing that's important, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, is the mental side of things. And that's, and that's equally as important in the process as musical and technical. So that we have these three parallel streams that are running that are, that are really super important that we practice. If we, if we neglect, we would never dream of neglecting our technique practice, but if we neglected that, our horn playing will suffer. We're not gonna be able to have as great a musical product. We, we often neglect the musical side. We just think, oh, we just play the notes and it's fine and I'll just sort of get around it. And we end up playing how we think we're playing, but we're not really aware because we're so embedded in, in or locked in to our, our playing of the instrument we're not really aware of what the musical output is and, and our musical idea is, is clouded by our technical ability. But we, we generally do a pretty good job of, of understanding music and what we want to do. But if we take a great level of technique and a great level of musicality and put it into a pressurised situation and we don't have a mental plan and we haven't practised mental things, funny things happen, <laughs> as we all know. Right? We get nervous. When we play concerts, we get nervous. Who, who gets nervous in a concert? <laughs> no, yes, of course we all get those. I think the only, there only, there's only one musician, and, and I may be wrong, but there's only one musician that I've observed in my career who, I, who doesn't appear to get nervous, and that's Emmanuel Pau, um, who's a flute player in the Berlin Phil. And it's like watching him before a concert is hilarious because it's just like he he's, it looks like he's just about to go to lunch or dinner or you know, go to a party. Like he's, he's so relaxed, it's amazing. But most of us, slash almost all of us, uh, have to deal with some level of, uh, of stress and nervousness in concerts. And it's important to acknowledge. And developing a plan for that, for mentally, and what goes on inside of our heads, all this stuff of like, oh, you're going to muck the next stuff up, or Jesus is going to go right, or you haven't prepared enough, or you've pre prepared too much, or my chops don't feel so good, all of this inner talk that goes on in our head when we're in concert, that can be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be... Um, managed if you want to play at the level that you think that you think you should most people will perform at a lower level than what they're capable of doing under stress if they don't have a mental plan and my mental plan that, that i've worked out over the years enables me actually to energize my performance and i actually play better in concerts than i do in rehearsal because it really helps me to focus and and it keeps me on track it doesn't mean that i play perfect it's, it certainly doesn't mean that I play perfect, but it, it means that I play consistently at, at the level that's close to what I'm, what I'm doing if I'm playing perfectly in the, in the practice room. And often it actually really gives me the energy to, to get through some really difficult stages, but it also helps me to stay, to stay focused and to recover from things uh, that may not be perfect in the concert. So I think that pretty much covers it. How to build links, five key ideas. What's that, Rufal? Well, that was, <laughs> yeah, you're making me laugh. Um, that was your, that's your five key ideas that we just talked about. That's those. Oh, okay, great. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad I covered that. That's fantastic. Those five key ideas. All right, good. Uh, okay. And then customize to match your goals. So yeah, it's, it's important that, you know, that we put a plan, you can put a plan. So we talked yesterday about, uh, about Strauss concerto, right? So the Strauss concerto we talked about, you know, what are the, that was the goal of the week for me to play Strauss on uh, live on YouTube next week. If anyone holds me to that, I'll have a quick chat with you. Uh, and then, and then what are the elements? What are the, what are the elements? What is the, what are the processes that I need to perform that? And then how, what are my practice goals for that sort of thing? And so, so this is what we want to be, we want to be, putting this together for, for how we can approach every piece. So if I'm learning Till Ollenspiegel, for example, what are the skills that I need for Till Ollenspiegel? Well, I need to be able to articulate. I need to be able to play soft, high, low, loud. I need to get over a register break for me between the G and the pedal C, and I need to have good rhythm, right? So what's the bridge? The bridge for that is I need to find studies and exercises that are gonna incorporate those techniques. So I'm gonna be finding there's a bunch of really good exercises in Coprash that have intervallic staccato stuff. Um, I've got a bunch of low register stuff that we know in the, from the warm up that's going to keep my technique nice and stable as I head into the low register and as I move through the pedals. And, uh, and then I, I, I want to be able to have 
you know, uh, studies that are going to have some rhythmical element that's going to that's going to make me sort of challenge me and expand my rhythmical stability. And then on the other side of the bridge, what are the musical things? Well, I need to find uh, the I need to have a listen to the piece for a start, and I need to try and find a way that I can that I can embody that and I can get an image for that piece that makes me feel that makes it feel unique to me. And then I can sing them. And then and something we we didn't really touch on. Uh, that I wanted to was the, the concept of sing, blow and play. So that I want to sing the idea in my head and have as clear as clear as crystal idea in my head of, of what I want that piece to go like. And then I want to make sure because my mechanism is based on, on breathing and blowing, I want to blow that through either onto my fingers or in, through a straw or onto the back of my mouthpiece. I want to blow that picture as clear as possible and be aware of how I feel. And then I want to transfer that to the horn. So I want to focus on those two elements, sing in my head and blow, and then I put it into the horn and see what happens. And if I execute those first two steps as well as I can, generally the result will be pretty good. So that pretty much covers the bridge. I hope that makes some sense to people. If you have any questions or uh, concerns, let us know. Hi, yeah, I have... I have, I have a question. Um, in the um, in the example you you used about the um, you know like the six month audition preparation for like maybe like the first horn spot in the uh, in the Berlin Phil, and the um, and like the two parallel things um, the the music um, and the uh, and the technique um, like at at what point do those do those two things meet or um, are they always like meeting? Um, and then and then if if you could talk about like how you um the process you have for um, score study. So, so it's kind of like two, two questions um, if, you, if you might be able to touch on. Yeah, so, so for me, the, the, the process, and I have, um, and as I say, we'll, we'll go into this a, a lot in the, in the program because it's, it, it's a really important thing and everyone's, everyone's very personalized in how, they, in how they deal with these things. Most people I find will play excerpts um, way earlier than, than I would expect. So, it, it's going to be different for everybody because if you're if you're a student who's never played half of the list, you probably wouldn't be also auditioning for the Berlin Field. But um, but if you if you don't know the list, then that's gonna that's gonna you're gonna probably spend time a little earlier in that process, a little further out from the audition to start playing the excerpts to get familiar with them as as a physical sensation. For somebody in my position, I because basically any audition that I would do at this stage. There's hardly anything on there that I haven't either played in the orchestra or haven't played multiple times in an audition. I would, it wouldn't be before like a month before the audition that I would put those two points together. Um, and often later than that. Uh, so, but I would be, I would be spending, and this is exactly, we, we will actually develop with each person that's in, in the program, we're actually going to work through every single excerpt that, that you know, that you'll come up with that, will, that could be an audition and actually make an individual plan for those particular excerpts. Um, so, that we, so that we have a technique structure, we have a study, study structure leading towards the excerpt and then we have a, a clear way of, of preparing uh, each, each excerpt from a musical standpoint. In terms of score study, uh, I tend these days I tend to do a lot more listening than I do uh, actually studying the score, and that simply becomes comes from the majority of repertoire that I've that I've been you know that, that comes up I've played before, and I'm and I'm just I'm just getting my bearings as to what I'm wanting to hone in on. Um, so for me, spending time listening. And, and seeing my part and spending a lot of time listening and, and listening to what I'm interacting with is, is a, in practical sense for me very useful because it, it, um, it sort of heightens my awareness for when I get in the orchestra and it gives me a plan that, okay, in this spot, I'm taking over from the bassoon, so I've got to lock into the bassoon and make sure I blend with his colour. Or in this spot, I've got a, I'm, I've got a, a three-way, um, you know, a trio with the... With the in Brahms one with the with the oboe and the and the violin. So I've got to be aware of like thinking about what colour I want to make in that blend. How can I contribute to making that one sound? So I do I, I tend to do that approach more so than actually sitting down with the score so much. But there are certain pieces like Mahler symphonies I will revisit quite often with the score just to to make sure what I'm what I think I'm hearing I'm actually hearing. 
And the trick with Mahler, of course, is that he'll often write various dynamics across the range of the orchestra that are not related to what you're doing. So it's interesting just to see that information. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's really helpful. Don't go just yet. Look at this big pile of money. Okay, I, I am gonna talk about taxes. I know it's not something everyone's excited about and I'm not gonna get into all of, I mean, tax law is complicated. I'm not gonna get into all the details of it, um, but I'm gonna show you something today right now that when we learned this, I don't know, Andrew, you'll have to tell me, but this sort of changed, this was a game changer for us. And um, I just wanna share it with you. It's, it's, it's pretty fundamental, but as Andrew's been talking about with his bridges, the fundamentals are really important. And you know, with, with the tax laws and doing taxes in general, I know for many years, Andrew and I felt like we weren't, we didn't know the rules of the game and it was hard to, you know, it's hard to play a game when you have no idea what the rules are. It's even harder to win. <laughs> so that is kind of the approach I'm gonna take here. And um, well, yeah. I, have to say, I have to say, Ripple, when, when we moved to, to the US and joined our finances, I was the person that did the taxes. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it lost me probably 20 years of my life, I think, because it was, I mean, going from various tax systems and, and, we, and we just had no idea. We had no idea of what we could claim. We thought we knew what we could claim. We thought we knew how to you know, manage things. And what we discovered was that there was very few, like our, our CPA didn't give us any heads up. They, there, was, there was very little information. So I, I was just sort of trying to get as much information as I could, but do the best that I could. But I'm sure we left a lot of money on the, on the table. Which yes. Yeah. That is, so that is why that is why we want to pay attention to tax and you don't need to know all of the details, but you need to kind of understand some basics. So, um, and then in addition, just like we talked about yesterday with the earn system and things, you know, while our industry is fluctuating and, um, you know, some changes around income potentially using that earn system to reduce your expenses and then redirect your money towards the things that matter. It's going to help you achieve your goals. Well, this is the same, this is the same concept. Taxes fits into that same bucket. So that's why we've chosen it. It's something that you can do um, that you have control over and it, it just takes a little bit of effort. So we're going to help you with that. Okay. So before I get into taxes, because it is a financial discussion, you know, everybody's different and special and unique. And we tell this to our boys, but it is actually very true. And especially when it comes to your financial situation. So, you know, we're going to talk about, we're going to speak about things generally I am not a CPA or a CFP. I'm registered and certified licensed to do taxes. And I've been studying tax law because, because I like it. And uh, I like being informed. And um, that, so that is my background. Um, you know, I've specifically been researching and understanding tax law in respect of how it impacts you know, musicians in our particular lives. And Andrew and I have gone through, I mean, maybe you can talk about this more, but we've gone through this journey that, you know, you guys might be on at some points of your life. Well, basically, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we started out as where we weren't claiming anything and then, you know, adding our sole proprietor. And then we've shifted into creating an entity. And we've kind of taken lots of different steps as we've grown that side of our lives. Um, and so we've, we have a lot of experience at different levels as was kind of that point. Yeah. So, you know, this is called the Music and Money Workshop. I showed this to people yesterday, so I'll just breeze through it. But basically your musical career, in your musical career, as you're successful, you start to earn money. And that is, you know, something that we hope to get into our accounts. And a portion of that, we want to reinvest back into our career so that we can, you know, raise our earning potential. We, I do this in my career. We do, everyone does this in their career. You start out, you know, younger, you're earning less. And then as you get better and develop yourself and build your skill set, you're able to earn more. And so you're increasing that earning potential. Well, if you think about this as kind of a train route, your money is going to have to travel through some different stops before it gets to your account. And so this is, you know, this is the big picture. Yesterday, we talked about spending. That's one of the stops where you end up with less in your account. Um, and today we're going to talk about taxes. That's one of the first things that happens to your money. It's one of the you know stops on this train route, and um, 
very important. So if we can, if we can kind of understand these different stops and then like squeeze them and, you know, strat figure out how to make them work in our favor, then ultimately that's going to leave more money for us in our bank account that we can then decide what to do with. And we talked about, you know, having those goals so you can redirect that money towards your goals. So that's why we're here. Um, I hope that, I hope that always makes, I hope that made sense. We're going to talk about more deductions, less taxes. So I'm going to focus this conversation on how we get to less taxes. So really simply put guys, and this is, this is just, you know, I know everyone has varying expertise around income and taxes. This is the fundamentals. So, you know, forgive me if this is um, basic, but I think it's just important to recognize. And I also want to just um, also, you know, I know there's some people who are international, but if you ever plan on doing it work in the U S or if you have, you know, it's important to understand this so that you can make sure you're keeping more of the money that you do earn. All right, so income minus deductions is the amount of income that gets taxed, which is called your taxable income. Then we take, then the IRS takes that taxable income and then multiplies it by a tax rate. There's different ways they calculate that. And then that's the amount of tax that gets calculated. All right, so if you don't have deductions, then your total income is going to be your taxable income. So that's why it's important to have deductions. So this is the strategy that I, I wanna communicate. More deductions, you lower your taxable income, and then ultimately you lower your tax. You lower your tax. I know a common question, you know, Andrew, we've had in, over the years is well, what can you can, what can and can't you deduct? So if we think about the tax system as a game, I just, I wanna first let you know, there's actually two games going on in the, in the tax system with the IRS. And that means there's two sets of rules. So you need to kind of understand the difference here. And that's what I wanna go through. There's one game for people who earn W-2 only. This was kind of me for most of my life. And then there's another game and another set of rules for people who earn W-2 plus or just completely outside of W-2 income. All right. So I just want to let that set in for a second. There's two games, guys. There's two sets of rules, two different ways deductions work, and you have to keep them separate. All right. So most Americans fall into this first category. You know, not you guys. <laughs> well, some of you, but this was, you know, me, my whole career for most, most of my career. Earning W-2 income, didn't have side money. And my options were for deductions, where to take a standard deduction based on how I was filing. The IRS would say you can have a lump sum deduction of, you know, whatever, 12 and a half thousand if you're single. Or I could itemize my deductions, but they were going to tell me exactly what I could itemize and there were limits. So short story, you can't, you don't get to choose what you itemize, what you deduct, and it's limited by the IRS. So they're telling you what you can and can't deduct. All right, that's most people. Um, business owners, on the other hand, they receive income that is outside of a W-2. You guys are, many of you are familiar with this. So, all right, so I just want to be really clear. There's two systems. So there's, on the, if you're a W-2 earner, most Americans, you can just deduct what I told you. You've got the standard numbers the IRS tells you. If you have income outside of your W-2, you are allowed to deduct your work-related deductions, and you get to decide what those are. But the catch is that those deductions are only going to offset the tax you owe on your non-W-2 income. All right, so it's like you're going to keep them separate. If you have a W-2 and you had to buy, if you only have a W-2 and you had to buy an instrument to do that job, you don't get to deduct that. Okay, so if you only get to deduct your work-related deductions if you have income outside of the W-2. So what we end up doing or what musicians end up doing, and Andrew and I have been doing this for many years, is we end up doing our personal deductions and we choose between the standard or the itemized. And that helps reduce our taxable income on our W-2 income. And then separately, we list all of our deductions that apply to the income that you know, Andrew was earning from his outside orchestra jobs. And, and then that was a separate equation, all right? And the other piece that was really, like, really interesting for when we, when we realized that we had these two systems was that the IRS considers anybody who earns income outside of a W-2 a business owner. 
Now, I don't know how many musicians consider themselves business owners if you're a sole proprietor, for example, but the IRS thinks of you as one. And that is why they're giving you these extra deductions, which is really a huge benefit that most Americans, as we talked about, don't get to do. Deducting your instrument. Well, it depends on if you have if you have income outside of your W-2, yes, you can deduct your instrument against that income. Recently changed it where now if you have a W-2, this is the new law, you're not allowed to deduct your instrument against your W-2 income. So we, remember we talked about how deductions reduce that taxable income. So you can't use your instrument against W-2 income. There's a ton we can get into and my goal is to I'm going to show you some fundamentals, something you can do right now today. And I want to make it really simple for you. Okay. Because tax is complicated. So we're going to have to take this in small bites guys, but I promise if you stick with me, you're going to, you're going to find some, some big wins. Okay. So you guys, so I want you to make sure you, you understand and you recognize that you guys are business owners in the eyes of the IRS. The things that the IRS requires, are actually helpful things in generating income. So don't look at it all like it's something that, you know, oh, we have to do and we have to put this together. Um, actually, it's, it will help you kind of understand your financial side of what you are managing. And, you know, you are the, you are the salesperson of your career. You are doing the marketing. You are doing the product. You are building that product. You, you are running in a, in, in a way a business. So, um, that's a mindset that Andrew and I had to really kind of understand and adjust our, our way of thinking. Um, and once we did that, okay, it, things became a little more clear. So those are the two gains. I'm going to focus on the outside W-2 income that you may or may not receive. And I think a majority of us do receive that. And we're going to talk about the rules of that game. So the game is if you get more deductions, you can win because you're going to get lower taxable income and lower tax, right? We want to raise our deductions. So what are the rules? How do we make sure we're doing that within the confinements of the law? Because this, you guys, this is law. Um, so I think it's important that we make sure we, you know, we're following the law. So rule number one, the expenses have to be ordinary and necessary. You know, I read this. I don't think it's too much to ask um, that you need to make sure that the expenses that you needed to buy them. You didn't need, you know, you may not need a yacht to do your job. That doesn't count as ordinary necessary, but gas, yep. Instrument, music, food, yeah. Instrument maintenance, obviously. Did you guys know that the IRS can't define this for you? They are not, you know, sitting on the board of Amazon telling them what they should and shouldn't spend money on. And they won't do, they're not doing that to you guys either as you're running your own personal business of your, you know, of your music. So you guys get to decide what's ordinary and necessary for you. I mean, it could basically be anything. All right. And, and I think that's where what's interesting is we hear, we hear, you know, some people are like, well, I'm deducting haircuts. That's ordinary and necessary for me. Or someone saying, well, I'm deducting my clothes and I'm deducting this. And, you know, we don't know, is that right? Or is it not right? You know, it's unique. Oh, go ahead. Can I, can I just, I just wanted to clarify, I, sort of a clarification and a question. So it's the expenses must be ordinary and necessary in pursuit of income. Yes. Yes. If you're, if you're having a lesson or if you're, you know, if you're trying to do some level of learning, that is going to further your potential for income. So it would be deductible. And the same with sheet music, the same with buying recordings. That is all part of your development in order so that you can, you can earn income and it's ordinary and necessary. So it would, uh, it would be deductible. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So you have to meet both criteria. So is it ordinary? Are these common things in the industry that people need you know, to earn income or to go after income? And then two, you know, is it necessary? Does it get you, not only does it get you more income, does it get you income faster? The IRS is fine with that. You know, maybe you needed a new computer um, or you needed to travel to, you know, learn with a teacher that, you know, was really amazing in one aspect. And it, it could help also. Yeah. So more income, faster or more efficiently. If you have a, if you have a logo for your business, which is a good idea and it's, you know, you can, anyone can produce a logo. If it is on that clothing, then it is deductible. 
So if you want to deduct your clothing from your from your 1099 income, create a logo, put the logo somewhere on your on your clothing, and it becomes a deduction because it would it's work related. And if it's if it's where if you're wearing that clothing to to earn income, and it's and it's ordinary and necessary part of your earning income, then it's deductible. Yeah. And then, then we could get into, but we don't have time. But if there's something that you wear for personal, but then you also wear for business, you know, if it's, a, it's an expense that you use personal and business, you need to figure out a percentage. You can't take 100% of your, you know, computer cost if you're going to use it for some personal stuff. So ordinary, necessary, does it help you get income sooner, faster, or more of it? It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have income. You're still allowed to take expenses while you're trying to get income. And the IRS gives you like, you know, three to five years of where you're starting out and they're not expecting you to have, you know, incredible amounts of income, but you can start expensing. So I think for students who are just starting out, you know, you should look at this as a potential strategy for setting up that piece you are spending money trying to get that income it's not every business starts off earning you know money right away you still get to have that benefit of those deductions um the expenses have to be justified and documented so what i think the main point of this is you need to be able to tell a story as to how that expense especially if it's a large expense helped you you know in the pursuit of that income um, we we recommend having some sort of like business journal or a document or something where you you know can jot down some of your big expenses and tell that story but you are able to deduct you know like your entire car which is a big purchase but you know making sure you have that documented and um, making sure you know what percentage you're using and how to calculate that percentage so you want to know what you have your list of deductions and then you want to make sure that they're justified and documented and that you can tell the story of how you needed that income and it helped you get that income or sorry, you, how you needed that expense and how it helped you get that income sooner or more of it or more efficiently. And something like a journal or, you know, writing a couple of things down. Those are small things now that will give you some big rewards. So it has to be justified. You have to document it. You know, I mean, Again, I don't think this is too much to ask. This is rule number two, all right? And I think that you guys are probably already doing this. This would just be sort of documenting it. If you, if you were audited, they could go back three years. So that's how far they can go back. They can open up your last three year tax returns and, and then go through those with a fine tooth comb. You know, they're not gonna make you pay more tax than you owe. They will pay, make you pay the amount of tax that you owe, but if you did owe, you will be, there will be interest and penalties. It's just something to think about. Andrew and I prefer to kind of take the approach of, um, you know, managing everything according to the law. And, and then we just sit back and relax. And if anyone wants to come on and knock on our door and audit us, then, you know, we've got all the documentation and we're ready to go. So implementation is hard. You have to put it into a routine and make time for it. But uh, the rewards are I think the rewards are high. So the last rule is, um, you know, the expenses have to be legal, of course. I don't think anyone's trying to do anything illegal here. In code and ethical. I always like to think of it like this. If you're asking yourself the question like, oh, should I, do you think I can, do you think I could deduct this? Or like, you're trying to find something like, then, then there is a question. Then the IRS is gonna ask that same question. All right, so if you, if you, if you are feeling like it's, questionable than the IRS is. It doesn't mean you can't deduct it. It just means you need to, for those particular expenses that you're not sure about, you need to kind of make sure you have that story in place and that you're, you know, making that little extra effort to make sure that you're doing things within the law. The strategy is we're going to find deductions and we're going to reduce our tax. That's going to make, give us more money in our pocket that we can put back into our career and towards our financial goals. We need to tell a story. You need to connect that expense to the pursuit of income. You know, how did that, you know, car or that instrument or that trip to Russia or whatever it is, help you get additional income? You guys get to decide what expenses are ordinary and necessary based on you. You're running your own business and, um, and, and what is going to help you. So we want to build a system for 
where you're doing this, when you do it and how long you do it. So I talked about where, if you can have a business journal or a, just like a, just start a Google doc and just, you know, start putting some of this information in how you do it. Um, so we talked yesterday about this earn system. And I basically said, you can look at your credit card statements and your bills, and you can go through the lens of what can you eliminate, reduce, negotiate and switch. Well, Tax is just another layer on that, but it, the acronym didn't work out as well. So we just left it on the side. But after you've reduced and really, you know, reduced your spending as much as possible, then you go through all of those expenses and you figure out which ones could be tax deductible, which are ordinary and necessary and helped you in the pursuit of income. So you want to go through and understand all of that. Um, and then I recommend you can just do this every three months. So just, this is just one other layer in your earns system, your routine, you're gonna do it every three months. You're gonna look at how you can reduce your expenses. And then uh, as well, you then circle the ones that are tax deductible and you guys will have a lot. You know, the criteria is not that, it's not that difficult, ordinary, necessary, and then just make sure you can justify it. We wanna be ethical, everyone wants to be ethical. You know, we want to be good people. We want to follow the rules. If it's, if you're not sure and you're, and it's questionable, then, you know, think about how it might be a percentage of that uh, deduct that total cost. You know, does that, is that more appropriate? You know, maybe it was only a percentage of that trip to Colorado, um, whatever. And, you know, be reasonable. And if, if you have a question, then the IRS will also have a question about it. And, um, and we just want to, we want to follow those rules and, and if you do, then you shouldn't be fearful of an audit. You can relax. You're going to know what your finances are because if they audit you and they do find out that you owe, uh, again, I'm not trying to scare you, but this is just, this is just fact. If they do find out you owe, then you're going to be stuck with a large bill and it's going to come out of nowhere and it's going to derail, you know, the, your other financial situation. So it's just not worth it. You know, all you have to do is write some things down and even your effort of taking your bank statement and circling that if that's in your calendar and you've got, you know, your document of showing like how you came up with those deductions, like that, that's something, you know, you could put that in. That's something that the IRS agent would be able to take is, okay, this person's actually making an effort to understand what they can and can deduct. So with all of that done, you just take a deep breath. Everything's fine. You get your taxes done. You're not worried about an audit and you know, life is good. And then you can focus back onto your music. Um, so just to recap, we talked about two systems. Um, there's one for the W2 soul earners and then for people who are not W2 earners. And actually um, a family story of mine is when we first moved to the US, we're immigrants from India. And probably one of the first things we did was start a family business. Uh, my, my mom was a daycare provider, actually. So that was something that, so we learned that there were two tax systems in America really early on when we came. And we, were, we quickly understood where the, most of the benefits are. So they're, they're in the system that most of you guys are actually in. And if you're not in, then you know, it may be a, a, an area that you want to consider because there are lots of benefits. You guys are, as I just said, you're essentially business owners and the IRS expects you to do some basic things to act like a business owner. And when you do those extra things, you get extra benefits. So, and the deductions we talked about, you know, that is a strategy we can use to reduce your tax. Um, I talked about how you have your income minus deductions is the amount that gets taxed. So the more deductions you have, obviously the less amount of income that's going to be taxed and then the less tax you will pay or you will owe. And then there's a lot of other calculations that go into this guys, but I, I hope you're, you know, at least getting the impact of deductions. They need to be ordinary and necessary, justified and documented. And then, you know, we need to be legal and in code. I hope you guys got some, some basic fundamentals understood and can feel like you could maybe approach it. Tomorrow we've got on deck. We're, as Andrew said at the beginning, We've covered a lot of topics. And again, these are just sort of, you know, samples and things. We chose some things that we think you'll be able to get results with quickly. Um, tomorrow, we're really excited. You know, Andrew, talk, Andrew, I'll let you maybe kind of talk about tomorrow. 
you know, as we said, I'm, it's going to be talking a lot about how the mental side affects us and how, how mentally how we can prepare and maybe things that you're not aware of that, you're, that your brain is actually, you know, messing with you. But how to, how to deal with nerves, how to channel those nerves, how to best, uh, just, just some ideas about how, how you can approach the mental game and just understanding that whether you like it or not, your brain goes with you into performance. And it can, it can work for you and it can work against you and, uh, and understanding that, accepting that and then figuring ways to have a plan uh, to make it work best for you is really important. And then just how we can, how we can help you to invest in, in moving forward. Yeah. And, I, and I, th I said this at the beginning, but we're really conscious of the fact that the industry is changing and experiencing some um, different circumstances right now. Uh, we are going to talk all about that and how to manage uncertainty and still set yourself up, you know, to reach your, those goals. So we're, we're pretty excited. Tomorrow's going to be kind of our, our, big, our big day. So we look forward to seeing you guys all there. And Thank you all and have a great Thursday. We're going to go celebrate Sebastian's second birthday. I need to bake a cake. Or Andrew, maybe you can bake the cake. I'll bake the cake. <laughs> Andrew's really the cook in the family. So, <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.